Well, this, I have to say first that this is the most challenging mission that the UAE has launched. So it involves a, a spacecraft called the MBR Explorer. Hi, I'm Sarah Fawcett, news editor here at The National, and welcome to this week's edition of A Closer Look. Now, it has been a really busy week in terms of space exploration, and nobody has been working harder than our resident space editor, Sarwat Nazir. I'm very pleased to say she joins me in the office now. Sarwat, thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me, Sarah. So we're going to, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. We will get to it, but we're going to start at the beginning. Two Saudi astronauts have just, at time of recording, splash landed back down to Earth Tell us a little bit about the highlights of their eight days in space. Right. Well, it really is a historic moment for the region. Um, Saudi Arabia launched the first Arab woman to go on a space mission, as well as the first Saudi citizen, citizens to go to space in nearly 40 years. Uh, Prince Sultan bin Salman launched on a week-long trip in NASA space shuttle in 1985, so we have not seen any Saudi citizens launching to space since then. And this was a scientific mission that the astronauts uh, went on, on on the orbiting outpost where they uh, took part in many scientific experiments. Uh, Rayana Bernavi is a research scientist with more than a decade of experience in stem cell research. And she car carried out very crucial work um, on human uh, immune cells and their inflammatory response in microgravity. And uh, the UE astronaut who's there on a six month mission actually assisted Rayana Bernavi on this experiment. So it's actually kind of great to see, you know, Arabs from different countries in the region working together in space. It's never been done before. Um, and then we're also seeing Ali Al Karni, the other Saudi astronaut who also took part in many experiments aboard the station, as well as researching different cloud seeding techniques um, uh, on the in microgravity conditions. So overall, a very historic moment, not just for Saudi Arabia, but as well as the region. So we know UAE astronaut Sultan Al Niyadi is still up there. He's going to be there for six months. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the future of UAE in space. But what, now that these Saudi astronauts are down, is there any plan now for um, Saudi Arabia to explore further into, into space? So this was the first mission by Saudi Arabia as part of their long-term astronaut program that they launched just last year. So what the kingdom is now hoping that more astronauts from the, uh, from the country would launch on more missions, especially long duration missions. So mm -hmm. not just for eight days, but maybe even six months. Um, and they're not just looking at low Earth orbit. They also want to go beyond. For example, they have their sights set on the moon as well as Mars. Um, this is the international ambitions, really, to, ex to you know, go beyond uh, Earth's orbit and head to the moon and then maybe head to Mars from there and uh, really expand on deep space exploration. Wow. OK, that's quite <laughs> a plan. Um, OK, so let's move on. The asteroid belt mission. Mm -hmm. So it was a big week in news for that. Uh, why don't you just bring people up to speed as to like what is what is the UAE, UAE's intention by exploring this particular asteroid belt? Right. Well, this I have to say first that this is the most challenging mission that the UAE has launched. So it involves a, a spacecraft called the MBR Explorer named after uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, the uh, vice president and the ruler of Dubai. Um, it will launch in 2028 and explore seven asteroids in the main asteroid belt. So this is an, a region in space between Mars and Jupiter. So the UAE is going beyond Mars further than when where the Hope probe traveled. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to fly by uh, six asteroids gathering scientific data as it does those flybys. And then it, it will attempt a landing on a very mysterious astro reddish asteroid um, in the in the next decade mm -hmm. and uh, to get there it's going to use a gravity assist maneuvers from three planets that includes the first Venus so we might get images for, uh, of Venus from a UE spacecraft mm -hmm. and then it'll fly by Earth and then Mars and the great thing about this mission is not 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 just the scientific part but we're going to see uh, well what the UE space agency hopes is to build the private space sector here so the lander that is going to be on the spacecraft is actually going to be built, what they're saying is 100% by local startups. Um, so this, and it's great to see local startups winning contracts by space agencies here, because that's how NASA, for example, really stepped up their game. They mm -hmm. partnered with companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and others to make uh, more missions possible. And, and they increased their mission cadence 
by doing this. So this is really just the beginning of the UAE's uh, space ambitions, in my opinion, because we're going to see the local space industry being set up um, and them winning contracts through government agencies. And that's how you really develop that ecosystem. Mm. That's, that would be incredible to see real representation of the UAE and the wider region in space. Like, that's very exciting to look forward to. So obviously that would be, that's good. that sounds like a difficult mission, right? Mm-hmm. To get your, your, you know, craft to the asteroid belt and to land it on what I presume is a very fast moving asteroid. Um, and it just brings us to what happened with the Rashid rover mm-hmm. when it was, um, uh, you know, when the, the, the spacecraft there was attempting to land on the moon, it obviously didn't all go to plan. We've since then had a press conference and a bit more information come out as to exactly what happened on the moon when they were trying to land that. So, so tell us more about that. Sure. So Rashid rover, which was a small UE built rover, was actually uh, hitching a ride on a, la- a private lander built by a company called iSpace. Um, and that lander att- attempted a soft landing on the lunar surface. However, that didn't go as planned. And what happened was with the recent investigation findings, what that has shown is that the uh, lander ran out of fuel last minute. And that's because the software miscalculated the um, altitude it was on. So it it was actually closer than it thought it was. Mm. And therefore, um, because it already had used up a lot of fuel, the the altitude was completely miscalculated. And by the time it got to the touchdown part, it ran out of fuel and it free, it, it was on a free fall onto mm-hmm. the surface. So, and then the NASA spacecraft, NASA yeah. orbiter that's around the moon actually went and imaged the landing site and found four large pieces of debris of the lander scattered across the site. Mm-hmm. So um, rest in peace, Rashid Rover and Hakuto <laughs> RI space lander. So, because you often think like, well, it was almost there. What does it need more fuel for anyway? But if I understand this correctly, it's because it needs fuel to like reverse so that it can slow down, right? Exactly. So moon landings are difficult specifically because, uh, you know, it has no atmosphere. You can't use parachutes to slow a da- down a spacecraft mm-hmm. like you, you can do on Earth and Mars. You have to have thrusters, you know, and a great propulsion system to be able to uh, really carry out the braking maneuver and slow down the spacecraft, as well as adjust its positioning to be able to land softly um, on, on the surface of the moon, all in the meanwhile, avoiding, for example, uh, craters and uh, space, I mean, uh, space debris and as well as uh, lunar, lunar rocks, for example, that are on the surface. It's very mm. unpredictable. It's a 50-50 chance. And a lot of moon missions in the past have failed. Uh, China was the most recent one to su- succeed. And, but hopefully iSpace is building another lander and you know they have figured out what went wrong with this one, so maybe they can make the next one a success. And the UAE is also building a second rover called Russia 2. Mm. I love that attitude, by the way, because it was, it was almost like as soon as it went wrong, the engineers were like, it's okay, we'll do another one. In fact, I think they'd already maybe started building it. It was just, you know, there was, it, there was almost like there was absolutely no time to feel sorry for themselves. They just... Yeah, so the UAE has a long-term moon exploration program. Um, I'm pretty sure even if this, they're building the second one, there will be like a third moon mission, a fourth moon mission. Um, like I said, that's the international ambitions is to go to the moon. We're mm-hmm. looking past low Earth orbit. The day an Emirati astronaut sets foot on the moon, you are going to be so busy. I just, I can already envis- <laughs> envision it now. Um, but you know, it's the kind of busy that you like, right? So that's okay. Um, and now just to finish off, this is, it's obviously been really busy for the region in space, but also looking outside of the region, China just spent their, sent their first civilian into space, right? Yes. So that happened this week as well. And China has a space station in North orbit called uh, the Tiangong, which is a new space station by China. Um, so far, only Chinese ha- astronauts have occupied the station, but um, what's what we can expect maybe going down the line is, you know, they have shown interest in maybe opening it up to other astronauts from other countries. Now, China is known to be very, uh, have a very sort of secured uh, space program with uh, very localized and not a lot of international collaboration that has been, you know, gotten a lot of exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think slowly we're coming, we're seeing them uh, becoming more open to international collaboration as well. This was the first Chinese civilian to go to space. Uh, who knows, maybe in the future we'll see China inviting astronauts from maybe the Middle East or from other parts of the, the world. Mm. 
Wonderful. All right. You are one of my favorite people to have on the show, by the way, because all of this space <laughs> chat is so exciting. And we will have to, I mean, we'll definitely have you back. How much longer does uh, Dr. Sultan Aliadi have on the space station? So he is scheduled to come back uh, end of August. Um, and we'll see uh, a lot of the similar sights we saw today when uh, a dragon capsule brought back the two Saudi astronauts. It'll be incredible. <laughs> okay, so we'll definitely have you back at the end of August and possibly before then as well, depending on what happens. Right, thank you for coming in. <laughs> thank you for having me. Well, that's it for this week's edition of A Closer Look, brought to you from right here in the Nationals newsroom. Remember, you can find all of our previous episodes on our YouTube channel. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, you can leave your comments in the box below.